currently approved drugs for multiple sclerosis work on the immune system, but the next frontier is to regenerate injured nerve tissue by regrowing myelin through remyelination. It turns out that the human body has a tremendous ability to do this on its own. In fact, legendary neuropathologist Dr. Bruce Trapp in his famous research demonstrated that in the lesions of MS, even in advanced progressive MS, there are the cells necessary to regrow myelin, the oligodendrocyte precursor cells. But they don't necessarily differentiate into oligodendrocytes, the cells that grow myelin in the central nervous system, and they don't necessarily grow myelin. But many people would like to learn to trick these cells into actually growing myelin, and many substances are potential candidates as remyelinating therapies. And one of them is the very interesting drug Antilingo-1, or opacinumab, which is currently in phase three trials expected to be completed in 2022. And today we're going to review the phase two data and look at is this potentially a clinical remyelinating agent and how promising is it? And at the end, I'll give my personal opinion. Let's have some fun. Now, people make a big deal about stem cells, but you have something better already in your brain, which are the OPCs, oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And these are the cells that can develop or differentiate into mature oligodendrocytes, the cells that make myelin in the central nervous system. And of course, the myelin depicted here is the fatty sheath that covers the nerve fibers or axons. And of course, one of the hallmarks of multiple sclerosis is you get uh, mostly injury to the myelin or the fatty sheath of the nerve fibers and relative sparing of the underlying axons and remyelination can occur naturally and spontaneously which of course is why a lot of people make major major improvements with MS particularly after relapses. It's very common in MS for people to be in a wheelchair and then recover whereas that's relatively uncommon in diseases such as Lou Gehrig's disease. Now unfortunately there is some injury in MS to the actual neurons and to the axons, which is why some injury in MS can be permanent. Now here what you're looking at is an actual autopsy of someone with multiple sclerosis and the blue stain is for myelin. So this dark blue would be the normal stain. And you have some lesions that stain white. In other words, there's no myelin. However, you see some areas where there's a lesion but it's staining light blue. And what that is, is remyelination. And that's called a shadow plaque. Now if we look under the microscope, the myelin may be thinner than normal and the nodes of Ranvier, the natural junctions between myelin segments, may be close together and that's why it stains a little bit lighter but this tissue may actually function quite well which is why you can get something known as clinical radiologic dissociation in other words the clinical symptoms don't necessarily match up what we see on MRI and the reason is because tissue that's abnormal on the MRI may function relatively well especially if there's remyelination and sometimes this correlates with the MRI as well and you can get what are called shadow plaques on MRI so this is a T2 MRI to the left and T1 MRI to the right. And lesions look bright on T2 and sometimes they look dark on T1. And these are known as black holes. Now it turns out that T2 lesions aren't correlated that strongly with disability, but brain atrophy and black holes are correlated more strongly with disability. And the reason for that is because they tend to correlate with more injury to the actual nerve fibers, the axons, when people have subsequent autopsies. But sometimes you can have a T2 bright lesion where you don't have a T1 dark lesion, and this has been associated with remyelination and better functional outcomes. Now this process of myelin formation is tightly regulated within the nervous system. And the reason is because you can't just have more and more myelin. There are actually neurological diseases associated with excess myelin formation. And so myelin formation is regulated by this protein called Lingo-1. And that's the target of the drug we're going to discuss today. So Lingo-1 is a transmembrane protein. In other words, a protein that traverses the cell membrane. And you can see what it looks like off to the right. And it blocks oligodendrocyte precursor cells, the OPC 
species that we love from differentiating into mature oligodendrocytes. So it prevents you from forming myelin when you don't need to form myelin. And it actually works as a co-receptor with another protein called NOGO66. And the point is, we can actually block the inhibitor of myelin, in other words, block Lingo1, in order to get more myelin formation. And we do this with the drug opacinumab, or anti-Lingo1. So opacinumab is an antibody that penetrates into the central nervous system, into the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerve, and blocks Lingo1, allowing oligodendrocyte precursor cells to differentiate into oligodendrocytes and hopefully for myelin over the demyelinated axons, hopefully improving nervous function and reducing symptoms. But does this drug actually work? Well, let's take a look at a few of the phase two trials. So the first is the RENEW trial where they studied opacinumab in acute optic neuritis. These weren't necessarily people with MS, but they had optic neuritis or inflammation of the optic nerve. Some of them had MS and some of them didn't. But anyways, they gave a relatively high dose of opacinumab, 100 milligrams per kilogram intravenously every four weeks for 20 weeks or six doses versus placebo in a randomized trial. And 33 got the drug and 36 received the placebo. Now this is a small trial and many people with optic neuritis improve anyway, so it would be very difficult to demonstrate a difference in visual acuity. So they instead made the primary outcome an electrophysiologic test of visual function called visual evoked potentials. And I'll show what this is on the next slide. However, they also had secondary endpoints of retinal thickness and visual acuity. So if you're not so familiar with visual evoked potentials, it's a test where they put electrodes on the back of your head in the occipital or visual area of the brain, and they shine this checkerboard pattern into your eyes, and they record how much time it takes information to go from your retina to your occipital lobe. And it turns out it takes about 100 milliseconds with a normal optic nerve, and you see this deflection called the P100. P just means positive, and 100 means 100 milliseconds. But in people with optic neuritis, that time is prolonged, it could be say 115 milliseconds or 120 second milliseconds, and it can be longer than the normal eye. And so the thought was maybe this drug could cause better remyelination and shorten the latency of the visual evoke potentials. And that is in fact exactly what the researchers found. What you're looking at in light blue is the placebo of the visual evoke potential latency versus dark blue, the 100 milligrams per kilogram opacinumab, and you can clearly see a difference. Now they did cheat a little bit on the statistics here. So when you look at the intention to treat analysis, which is the typical way these studies are done, there was actually no statistically significant difference. You can see the standard error here. However, when using other methodologies called the pre-specified protocol, which is a specific protocol to analyze the statistics, and also something called mixed effect model repeated measure, and this is to account for different people receiving the drug at different times, they did show a statistically significant difference. So they did cheat a little bit on the statistics but if you look at this data closely, it does look like there's something going on here. However, when they looked at other measures like retinal thickness and visual acuity, there was absolutely no benefit to the drug. But again, this was a small trial and only in optic neuritis. They also looked at side effects. And there weren't really too many serious effects. One person had a multiple sclerosis relapse, and another person had optic neuritis in the other eye. But these are probably related to the underlying condition and not to the drug. However, two did have allergic reactions. Interestingly, they occurred with the second infusion and not the first. So allergic reactions is definitely a potential side effect with this drug. One person did have elevation of liver enzymes, but they went back to normal afterwards, and it wasn't a significant concern. So the RENEW trial wasn't all that important. Impressive, but the researchers were encouraged enough to go on to the next step of doing a larger trial in multiple sclerosis. And they got 418 people either with relapsing remitting MS or secondary progressive MS, and they were all taking the disease modifying therapy Avonex, which is beta interferon 1A intramuscularly once weekly, a relatively low efficacy therapy. And they actually did a dose finding study where they looked at different doses of opacinumab. They used the very high dose we saw in the RENEW trial. 
100 milligrams per kilogram, but also lower doses, 3 milligrams per kilogram, 10 milligrams per kilogram, and 30 milligrams per kilogram, as well as a placebo group. And they used a multi-component three-month improvement outcome, and you had to improve in one of these four categories. One was the time 25-foot walk, how quickly you can walk 25-foot feet. The next is the nine-hole peg test, which is a test where you put pegs into holes, sort of a measure of upper extremity co coordination. The next is the PASAT-3, which is a test of cognitive function. And the last is EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Score, which is sort of an overall measure of disability in MS, commonly used in clinical trials. And I have a separate video on this topic if you want to take a look. So overall, unfortunately, the drug did not work. They actually looked at what's called a dose response curve. So what you'd like to see is that as the dose goes up, it becomes more and more effective. And it may be a little bit difficult to see the small numbers, so I'll read to you the percentages of people who improved in one of the four categories. So in the placebo group, it was 51.6%. In the 3 milligrams per kilogram group, it was 51.1%. In the 10 milligrams per kilogram group, 65.6%. In the 30 milligrams per kilogram group, 68.8%. But in the 100 milligram per kilogram group, only 41.2%. So the highest dose, the dose we saw in the Renew trial, actually did worse than the placebo, and the overall results were negative. Now, cherry picking a little bit, you could say, well, wait a minute. Maybe the 100 milligram per kilogram dose was too much. Maybe there were signs effects. Maybe there was unregulated hypermyelination. Maybe we overshot a little bit here, but if you just cherry pick the 10 milligram per kilogram and 30 milligram per kilogram dose, they both did do significantly better than placebo. So maybe there still is something here. So instead of giving up, the pharmaceutical company is doubling down and putting their money where their mouth is in doing a large, long, phase three style trial called Affinity. And I'll leave the link to clinicaltrials.gov if you want to take a look. And they're studying relapsing or remitting MS only 263 participants, and it's a randomized double-blind trial. And they chose the dose 750 milligrams IV, so a flat dose. And if you figure a 75 kilogram person, this is about 10 milligrams per kilogram. So one of the two doses in the Synergy trial that looked good every four weeks for 72 weeks, so it's a little bit of a longer study, and that's part one, and there's also a 96-week part two, and they're looking at various outcomes. So I don't know if this study will be successful or not. Of course, I hope it is successful. Realistically, even if it is successful, it may be more of a modest benefit, not a major, major benefit, but even a small benefit over a long period of time could be very significant, and this just might be the first remyelinating therapy ever approved for any disease. So I'd like to know your thoughts on this. Are you hopeful for antilingo-1 opacinumab? Would you be interested in taking this drug? And do you have any suggestions for future videos? Arr, literally the day after I filmed this video, Dr. Barry Singer on Twitter posted this. He's an investigator for the trial, and so he got some inside information showing that Affinity was stopped because opacinumab was completely ineffective. It did not meet either the primary or any of the secondary endpoints, and a subsequent press release confirmed this to be true. And unfortunately, Biogen, the drug company that develops opacinumab, has decided that it's over. They're not going to continue their program because it simply didn't work. But as Dr. Singer said in his post, we have lost the battle, but we will eventually win the war. Although this remyelinating agent didn't work, we will eventually find a proven remyelinating agent in multiple sclerosis. So please stay tuned and don't give up hope.